So hello, Dr. Howard Jackson. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, you know my name already. Um, we are gonna ask a few questions to help um, have like information that future historians can look to in the to have like archives of information. So we're gonna ask you a few questions, and you can ask them as you can answer them as freely as possible. Okay. All right. Happy so. to do so. <laughs> All right, sir, so, so when did you come to the UC and what brought you here? <laughs> okay, so a very long time ago, uh, so in uh, 19, September 1974, and, uh, and so uh, that means I've been at the university for 45 years, uh, kind of thing. And uh, so I'm in physics, and so the, a typical way to an academic per career is um, one gets your PhD and then has a postdoc or two and then comes to a faculty position. And so uh, this was uh, an attractive position and uh, uh, with uh, interesting faculty members and so we came to Cincinnati. Okay. So um, what were you, were you, how passionate were you about teaching and like um, would you want to go into that a little bit? So I have two passions. Okay. <laughs> um, well, well, maybe three because you know there's research, teaching, and service as well. And don't forget that, please. And uh, so, um, as uh, as my record sort of indicates, then I was interested in teaching uh, to begin with. And uh, so the the what happens with a new faculty member in physics at that time was. Um, you were assigned, a, a, let's say, a course, and uh, you were told, this is the textbook, and, uh, and that was it. And uh, so that's a, uh, uh, that puts the person in a demanding <laughs> circumstance, and I'm sure my first students uh, found it demanding as well. So I learned lots there. And, uh, and then there's a whole arc here, but uh, uh, one of the things that... Uh, um, I did with help from the university. So the university had what eff effectively was a um, a faculty development fund mm -hmm. of, of a certain kind at that okay. time. And um, so you may be familiar with classroom response systems, you know, where uh, a faculty, you know, your instructor can ask you a question and uh, then you can answer it on your iPhone yeah, or your, okay, or your yeah, computer yeah, yeah. or your clicker, Clickers, yeah. clicker questions uh, kind of thing. And so, um, so I actually was the first individual to introduce that here, but it was called Class Talk, believe it or not, I remember. And uh, that was simply, and that was hardwired. So when students came into the class, and this is like a class of a hundred. Then um, the there was a, a Hewlett Packard. Um, well, we today we just say it's a calculator, but okay. it, they call it a computer, and it was mounted on a clipboard, and they had to pick one up as they came in. And then I spent one Christmas vacation uh, hardwiring the classroom. Probably illegal, and uh, um, and they uh, and so they plugged in. Now this was a nice system in the sense that uh, I could see, uh, could I ask a question, and I could actually see what you were doing. You know, there'd be a picture of the class, essentially a schematic of the classroom, and I could see that uh, Noel's got this one right. I'm going to pick on him and have him explain to the class what uh, what actually happened. Well, that's now evolved into a much more elaborate, uh, all wireless system, of course. But still is uh, is widely used the idea of uh, of pausing and asking a couple questions. So uh, so my interest in teaching was uh, early and often, I guess. So the clickers today are the um, instructors able to know who answered which question, right? And um, no, uh, yeah, yeah, I just yeah, see a yeah. poll on the board. Uh, uh, you. You can do that, but not as uh, conveniently okay. as this other system, okay. which of course was had a huge overhead. I mean, having to plug in and, and they didn't work, and you'd have to troubleshoot and all the rest. So it's uh, um, it requires then, I think, in this case, to uh, you have to know your student by name right. separately from the computer <laughs> uh, kind of thing. Okay, you mentioned um, teaching, research, and um, 
services how different are those from each other and uh, i think i know what research is but like how would you you do all three and so how do you fuse it together so uh, that's a good question actually but so i what i would say is faculty members are um, are curious people and uh, so they're doing their research that's certainly you're exploring new things that haven't been understood before i'm an experimentalist and so uh, um, that means there are laboratories that were in, involved, uh, research laboratories. Okay, and then um, for teaching, you know, uh, how can you do a better job? How can I make it so that all my students are successful and not just uh, a few kind of thing? And that's certainly something that the physics community, but also uh, the department here at the University of Cincinnati has been active in pursuing. So again, you're asking questions, you're curious, and uh, trying to do a better job at, uh, at what you're doing. Service is a, uh, a kind of a different sort of thing that requires then a, a, a focus that has to include more than yourself, right? So you can say, I'm, I'm a you know, good researcher, or I'm a good teacher, that's an individual. But in the service uh, regime, then, uh, you're talking about interacting with a collection of people and then doing something for the university that actually is uh, uh, something that moves moves us towards excellence or moves us into a new area that we weren't uh, before uh, improves something uh, kind of thing so that's a, uh, a very different aspect of uh, of this and uh, uh, and it's uh, you know it's like any other personal interaction there are certain demands there that are uh, uh, that are unique I think Okay, um. so so I so <laughs> as you're saying this, then I'm remembering. Um, so when uh, you come to the university, when I came to the university, then one of the things you want to know is is there space so I can carry out my research? I mean that's sort of a basic thing. And so um, and before I actually came and interviewed and all the rest, I was assured, yep, there's a there's a large space for you. And, uh, and so I'm looking forward to seeing this space. And indeed, there was a large space. Okay, and this was in Braunstein, a building built in the 30s. And, uh, and I think this room had uh, maybe not been painted since the 30s. And, uh, and for sure, the um, electrical uh, um, supplies infrastructure was wholly inadequate. There were uh, dropping from the ceiling, incandescent, uh, you know, sort of 40 watt bulbs kind of thing. It was uh, uh, fairly primitive. So, uh, well, we got that done. And so my first uh, first effort in the lab was actually painting the lab. <laughs> uh, okay, anyhow. Yeah. I think you might have talked about this a little bit, but like I want to know what your hiring process was like. like so, uh, so there's an application, of course, and then, well, so I don't know what, how they were uh, making the evaluation here, of course, I wasn't here, but so um, you make an application in which you um, attach all of your efforts and, and, and say, uh, you know, this would be an interesting fit. And then you come, uh, physically come, if you're invited, um, one of the finalists, and, uh, and you spend all day talking to different individuals, and uh, not only talk to individuals, but then um, there is a it's called a colloquium, uh, a talk to all of the faculty and all of the basically graduate students. Um, so that demonstrates both uh, well something about your research and because that's what you're presenting, and uh, but something about your teaching capabilities. Can I communicate uh, what my work is about and why I think it's important, and uh, um, and also uh, where, where could this, whatever I'd done, where could this lead kind of thing, would that be interesting? And so, um, and so it's a, uh, actually it's a strenuous process in the end. <laughs> You're pretty tired by the end of the day, I'd say. Okay, so let's take it to the classroom. What did you hope your students took from your class like every day so um, one of the one of the pieces is that um, um, just as in history that you know something about then um, 
there's a way of looking at the uh, the world of interest, and so there's a physicist way of doing that as well. And so certainly, I hope to convey the basic physics concepts, but also that there is a um, a way of thinking about things that is uh, unique to a physicist. And I hope some of that was conveyed, and also something about the um, the elegance of the of the subject, and so it's very easy to get caught up into I don't know the details of I don't know, how to solve this uh, Gauss's law problem, but uh, but then you ought to be able to see you know this is part of a larger picture, and that develops of course not just in the first course but after a number of courses, and so I hope I initiated uh, some of that, and I hope uh, that the students uh, were were interested. So the first courses I was teaching were actually the majors. Which is great because you know they're well motivated and they're interested, and so they have questions that help propel the class in in, in good ways. Um, but again, I certainly learned a lot that first. I learned a lot <laughs> during that first year of teaching. Okay, and um, with regards to practicals, physics practicals, like has it like physics practicals in class, like like the lab work? Yeah, uh -huh. has it changed over time? Like. Oh, yeah, been like, sure, like a sure, sophistication sure. Of so I mean this is uh, uninteresting to anyone <laughs> except for people of my age. So this was a time when if you were an experimentalist and you were mm, technically up to date, then you could build measuring instruments that at least rivaled and sometimes were better than what you could buy commercially. So I have uh, a completely useless collection of knowledge of digital circuits and uh, and all the rest because now in fact uh, those are much more sophisticated and and I can say that I purchased the first computer in the department of physics so there you go <laughs> now you know they're computers that you, we've got them in our pockets right and uh, they're everywhere so um, so times have certainly uh, certainly changed yeah. in in that sense um, but what hasn't changed is you still have to bring to uh, to research, for instance, um, some uh, some deep thinking, driven by curiosity, but also driven by. Now I'm an experimentalist. Can the measurements that I'm capable of making then possibly inform the questions that I'm asking? And so those are hard questions and uh, ones that are always fun to uh, fun to engage in. So. As you, as you probably know, when you do research, and in some sense when you teach, uh, the outcomes are not for, uh, they're not uh, sort of uh, written in stone. There can be a lot of different ones. Like, gee, you know that research idea I thought was great? It's just not going to work. <laughs> now, some of them do work, and, uh, and that's, of course, exciting. So, let's talk about your, the relationship between like your colleagues, how was that? And like, do you have like any favorites or like any? And has it changed over time too? Like, so, so, yes. So in some sense, the whole research enterprise has changed. So, um, I I was what you would call an individual PI, principal investigator on on grants. Okay, that's fine. Um, and if you say, well, how does that compare now to what it was uh, back then? Um, I would say that now there is a much larger probability that I'll be collaborating with others, so that there are a larger number of people involved in the effort. And so I'm an experimentalist, maybe I'm collaborating with a theorist as well, or maybe, and this is really important in the area I'm in, um, there's a group that's making very special samples. So one of the things that I'm interested in, for instance, is uh, something called semiconductor nanowires. They're semiconductors that are uh, have a diameter, they're maybe a couple microns long, and their diameter would be a, a thousandth of your hair. Very small. Very small. Okay. So there are experts in the world that grow these and so um, that have as their research effort I need to want to I want to grow these very special samples well I have not I don't have that capability on the other hand I have certain uh, characterization capabilities that uh, this group doesn't have 
so we got together and they, uh, it's uh, synergetic. They provide the samples and we make the measurements of the physics and sometimes we find that you know this sample really isn't quite up to uh, up to snuff so to speak or the quality uh, we can tell is not really as uh, as good as it should be and so that's feedback to them and so it's a uh, um, an effort then that instead of involving uh, a graduate student and one faculty member then involves a larger number of people so the research enterprise how one does research actually uh, has changed in that sense and when you say collaboration, is it just amongst physicists or it's like with others, like in it's maths? Good, it's, good, it's a good question. And so, uh, you know, one of the pieces that certainly has developed over time is uh, the power of interdisciplinarity. And so, um, so I have, within the university here, I've collaborated with uh, certainly a half a dozen different faculty members from departments other than the department of uh, uh, Department of Physics, and uh, actually that's uh, um, uh, largely connected to engineering, but actually it even touched uh, CCM at, uh, at one point, so the College Conservatory of Music. Uh, because there's the physics of musical music, instruments, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, there certainly is a, a connection there as well. Okay. So how did you feel about or like how did you interact with like administration? So I have a good story, story here yeah, actually. <laughs> <you knew that. laughs> and, and, uh, that's, that's a question I hadn't thought about. So um, um, the um, so I live in Clifton, so just basically uh, on Howell Avenue, which is Ludlow, just sort of down at the base of the hill kind of thing. Well, so what? Uh, well, I. I, for many, many years, I walked to school. Okay, it's just a little over a mile or something like that kind of thing. So, uh, so I'm walking along uh, uh, one day and uh, up the hill, and uh, it was the weather wasn't very nice, and uh, uh, and this car pulls up next to me, and this is a big car, and I'm saying, what's this? <laughs> and so it was uh, President Joe Steger, oh, yeah. okay, and I had met. Uh, Dr. Steger in other circumstances, but not very much. And so, um, so we chatted, and uh, and he had questions for me about I don't know my experience and so forth. And uh, fine. And uh, so this then turned out to happen just by happenstance when when I come to school and when he comes to school, it was happening. I don't know, certainly a couple times a month or whatever. So I got to know him in a informal circumstance, uh, kind of thing, and then eventually, uh, if you uh, if you go on a little bit, then uh, um, I became VP for research and dean of the graduate school, and so that uh, the connection with uh, Dr. Steger clearly Steger. was, uh, at least in part, behind that uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so it's a uh, um, so I both have interacted with the administration, but also have uh, um, have been an administrator. So. Okay, were there any incidents, good, both good and like bad, like that happened? Would you like to share some of those with us? <laughs> um, hmm. <laughs> uh, Let's start with the good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You mean in terms of the administration, or um, um, it could be any incident, like on campus? It doesn't have to be with. Well, I think that the um, so in 1974, this was um, it was still a city university, and but transforming itself for the next year to to a state university, and uh, and I think that. Uh, transformation was uh, is actually really essential to the quality of the university that you see now. I mean, um, the well, the city couldn't support it, but uh, the state, whatever you think about the support of the state, um, provided uh, certain kinds of support, but also it also provided capital support. So if you said, "Hey, I want to uh, build a new building." 
then that was possible um, because of state uh, state funding. And between when I came and now, um, well, I'll make the estimate. I don't know. Probably about a billion dollars worth, literally a billion dollars worth of buildings have have gone up, and that's made possible then the. Uh, the quality of our programs and the quality of the research that's carried out in those programs and and serving students in uh, sort of appropriate uh, ways. So that's a, uh, a big evolution. Part of that, and not really part of that, but connected in time with that was um, the AAUP came in. Uh, so uh, American Association of University Professors. And uh -oh. so you may or may not know that um, uh, there is a contract that the faculty have with the university, so that says that uh, you know next year there'll be no salary increases or there'll be a two percent, whatever it is, kind of thing. And uh, that certainly has led to divisions, and so, um, and those divisions, part of the divisions there have to do with the fact that AUP has to represent. I don't know, people in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is research intensive, but also, um, gee, uh, um, Blue Ash as well, which is not research intensive. Well, those are different, quite different cultures kind of thing. But the same rules, okay, a lot of them are very useful rules, uh, were in place. And then there was this question of merit, whether there should be merit or not. Mm -hmm. And that certainly was divisive. Um, and so, um, you know, if you if you ask uh, a collection of people whether they you think they're average or they're above average, you're know, not surprised to find that the collection of people will always say they're above average, right? And uh, and so um, a good bit of the time, and especially early times, AUP did not have merit, and I thought that was um, I disagreed strongly with that uh, kind of thing. And there was, there were different views within the department having to do with that uh, kind of thing. So that certainly is a, uh, uh, a difficulty. Now there are always going to be tensions in a um, in a, a university this size kind of thing about what priorities should be, and so moving away from the AUP, that's even true, uh, um, you know, as an administrator, whether you're able to, uh, you know have certain priorities that you can put forward that people collectively agree on, um, well, that depends on how well you've crafted your arguments and what the local circumstance is. And so there have been uh, successes there and places where there weren't successes there. And, uh, and I think that that's not, uh, that's not an unexpected uh, kind of thing. Were there like any more events that you found? Uh, hmm. I, you know, it, it's uh, maybe it's selective memory here, but uh, nothing is coming to oh, okay, mind okay, that okay. Uh, you know. I wish there were some dramatic event. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, were play. you here for the implosion? Uh, for like, yeah, Saunders? Like, yeah, for, yeah, Saunders? Yes, I have. I uh, watched the. Uh, uh, got up early and watched the explosion. Implosion. Implosion. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 Okay. Uh, but that was time. I mean, that was not a safe building, and so. Uh, I'm glad we moved on from that. <laughs> now the next thing coming uh -huh. up, of course, is uh, you know, do you know Crosley, the tall building, chemistry building? Yeah, so. If you look out my window here, you, you know, it's a tall gray cement like, building, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so that was um, so. Here's a useless fact. That was a, and this took a year of negotiations, I think, a continuous pour. Meaning, it's when you start um, putting the cement in, then you you don't stop at any point because then it structurally won't be in good shape. You just keep on going. That means it's hard to take down. So they're struggling with that. That is oh, a yeah, current yeah, struggle about how they're yeah, what the timing of all that is and and uh, so forth. So, uh, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, how did the, or how does the university respond to your your needs, and is it doing a good job? Um, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so, for instance, um, in the sciences, then um, 
this there's been a great deal of effort and I've been part of that supported by the National Science Foundation on pedagogical advances what helps students learn more effectively let's say and one of the one of the pieces is that uh, you get the students to collaborate okay fine well wait a minute you need a space in which to do that so uh, these are sometimes called um, studio spaces or sometimes called teal uh, classrooms and uh, many universities have been um, actually made whole buildings that are fill, filled with these kinds of things and that allows a great deal of flexibility as opposed to fixed seating and so forth and, or stadium seating for that matter and, uh, and the university has been very slow to respond to that there's one uh, such uh, um, a small one, like 48 students, uh, one such uh, classroom in the library in Langsum, mm -hmm. the first yeah. floor there. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, I think the university, um, despite some advocacy, has not been responsive to, uh, uh, to those uh, sorts of developments. Um, in terms of um, uh, you know, there's a there's the 10,000 foot view as well. So, in order to have a active graduate program, in order to teach laboratories and so forth, you need graduate students and the STEM disciplines. Um, then, the expectation is there'll be an assistantship, uh, graduate assistantship, mm -hmm. and I think uh, those are um, not supported at the level that it is really needed to be. Uh, needs to be present. So that's a, um, I think, uh, a, a, a failure in the sense that the quality of the graduate student um, matters a lot. And, uh, and if a student, a good student, has a choice between uh, um, one university that has a higher stipend and the same demands on his or her time and, and another, then you, they might go to the one that is paying the higher stipend. And uh, so we can't, in certain circumstances, be competitive. So that's certainly the problem. Um, and uh, and I think it's recognized, and it's just a uh, it's a question again of priorities. So how about like very more um, personal needs? Like how, so uh, so you need space. I have space, okay. kind of thing. But the expectation is that. Um, once they, uh, a researcher gets his or her lab going, I'm talking about experimentalists now, and uh, then uh, um, they should be obtaining external funds. So, um, so most of my funding, for instance, uh, has come from the National Science Foundation, both on the research side, the physics side, if you will, and on the pedagogical or the teaching side. Um, uh, different divisions of NSF, but also that external funding allows you to do lots more than what you could do for just what you have locally. And you need it because some of the some of the circumstances are uh, simply you could say, oh well, now you have this piece of equipment or these collection of equipment, and you're all set, ready to go. But there, you know, you need bits and pieces of things, supplies, and so forth, and uh, and so you need this external funding. I think the university has also been um, slow to develop a model where central facilities can be used. So let's suppose you need um, some kind of characterization that your lab doesn't have, and others may need it as well, then is there a central place you can go that, and pay for whatever the uh, service is, some reasonable rate? Um, uh, that's a, that's a circumstance which uh, has been hard to uh, sustain in the, in the present climate and uh, where the university needs to support that um, in, in ways they haven't been able to. So that's a, uh, that's a limitation. Again, it's a question of priorities. Okay. And um, how have like students changed over time in terms of like population, um, diversity, and like other factors you can you Right, it's a good question. And so the, um, so I think the, uh, so 
so, so there are different uh, populations of students here. So I talked for a moment from about majors. Okay, then uh, we've um, over this time we've certainly increased uh, the number of majors by a large percentage and um, have attracted uh, more women um, and some minorities and uh, the. Um, quality is, um, the numbers have increased, but also the quality has. And so this uh, past year then uh, um, one of our undergraduates was a finalist for a National uh, American Physical Society Award uh, for her research, one of three finalists. And that's a really remarkable uh, achievement. And it speaks actually to the student, of course, but also to the mentoring that she's gotten from the person that she was working with. And so lots of our, I'm going to say virtually all, of our um, majors then have the opportunity to work with individual faculty uh, members. And sometimes that actually results in papers and so they really have a, a huge head start if they're interested in going on and, and uh, maybe even becoming eventually a faculty member. So uh, the quality of our uh, undergraduates has gone up, the numbers have gone up. And I think also the, um, uh, our graduate students have a, a record of being successful. So that speaks to the, um, again, to the mentoring uh, because um, maybe a little different than history, uh, there's a very fairly intensive uh, sort of mentoring going on um, almost on a daily basis for our uh, graduate students um, as well. We're also, as a department, uh, we um, also are um, have connected to some of the uh, high school teachers in the region, and uh, and we also are part of the APS, the American Physical Society, um, as a minority recruitment program that we're part of, and so we've had some uh, successes in that area as well. So I think uh, you know uh, collectively as a department, then. Uh, so there's an evolution so that virtually everybody is research active and everybody is uh, engaged in the issues that in some sense you think, well, society ought to be worrying about these issues. And I think uh, I'd, I'd say very positive things about the department in that area. And how about um, diversity? So the diversity, so I mentioned the uh, uh, minority recruitment program. and. Uh, and so there is a actually a, a separate committee in the department that's worrying about that and working on that. Um, and I'd say uh, medium success, not not hugely successful, but some success. Uh, it turns out that I think it was the third, um, it wasn't the first, um, that we graduated. So now we're talking about the graduate program. Um, uh, we graduated the first uh, third, or the third PhD in physics uh, of a black individual um, way back in the 30s, kind of thing. So uh, there certainly is a you could say there is a, a, a history there, kind of thing. Um, in uh, the STEM disciplines, then uh, um, you know, roughly speaking, the number of women is like 20 percent in physics. Not not great. And so uh, we actually have, we, we beat that number by a significant amount, both in our undergraduate and graduate populations. So um, anyhow, some efforts there that are, I, I would say, are continuing, if you will. Okay. Also, sir, um, with respect to um, un the unions, do you have any involvement, union, like unionization, do you have any involvement in that? or? No, I, I resigned from the AUP when they stopped uh, having merit. I thought that was um, <laughs> you know, simply inappropriate. And, uh, um, and that's a value in some sense. If you're not going to, in my opinion, if you're not going to uh, value merit, then, uh, um, then it's, well, that's a, a key piece that was missing, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> Uh, so uh, no, I have not had active involvement with okay. the uh, uh, with the uh, A U P. That's uh, that's certainly true, kind of thing. Okay, 
Okay. Um, what ha what on campus has changed since you s started till now? Like in terms of buildings, and in terms of well, like, a billion like, dollars. <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> yeah, and in terms a of lot. What? Well, what it also means is the quality of the, um, let's say, the research space, uh -huh. but also the teaching space. The quality of that has changed uh, um, as well, and so um, that's enabled things that just couldn't have been imagined uh, when I first came here. So that's a uh, uh, that's a terrific, uh, I think, uh, achievement of the state, state and of the and university. university. Um, and uh, so I, um, I in, in, in more recent times, if you will, um, you know, if, if you wound back, uh, I don't know, 10 plus years, then in fact there was no rec center. Uh, you know the rec center here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. And so that's, uh, um, that's a place that I frequent and, uh, and I'm glad that that uh, facility that's is there, thing, for yeah. instance. And, uh, and actually it's extremely well used, so it's not, uh, you know, you hear complaints about, oh, you know, uh, universities aren't paying attention to this or that, but they're going to have a climbing wall and this and that. Well, I think there's a place for the climbing like wall, wall and this and that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at least I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile. Uh, so the quality of life then on campus then has, has improved, I think, as well. So it's, it's a combination of things. That's improved, but then also the quality of the faculty, I think, has, uh, has improved for the research one. And, and I think that shows in, in lots of ways. And bene that benefits undergraduate students and graduate students. And uh, so that's all to the good. And um, has the UC's priorities shifted like since you started here, like in, in terms of um, you know like the way it started as in like a, uh, a municipal school, like like has it is it still like in is it still involved with like the community and all other things like that? Like ha has the paradigm shifted in any way? And how would so, you sorry? So I'd say the the central change is now. It is fully what's called a research one uh, university. Okay. So, um, the, all of the faculty members, uh, at least in the uh, in the Department of Physics, are research active, and that doesn't mean that uh, they're sitting around in their office diddling and doing something. They're publishing and doing all the things that you'd expect a, um, a really good university to do, and that's. Uh, you you can witness then the um, quite dramatic increase in external funding that it means you know if you if you get funding from the National Science Foundation that's reviewed at a very high level and you have to be nationally at least or maybe internationally competitive and so that's a, a measure that's uh, sort of objective meaning it, it doesn't depend on just what people are thinking locally and then having said that, then uh, a variety of faculty members do connect to the community and, uh, um, you know, visiting classrooms and uh, the uh, Cincinnati Museum Center has a, uh, uh, a nano day and uh, involved in nanotechnology and so uh, we go over there with graduate students and uh, have some demonstrations for people from ages four to 84, I can, and, and so that's, I'm going to call that modest outreach, but it's, okay. we're connected to the community in that, um, in that sense. We don't have a, uh, you know, some sort of elaborate um, public, um, you know, advertised outreach programs, and that's an area that uh, one can think of, but there are only so much you can do, and so I think the the fact that we're informally connected is very positive, and certainly I would encourage that. Something more formal would uh, um, would have to be thought about. Can we actually carry that off, and do we have the funds to carry it off, et cetera? So, uh, but that's uh, that's certainly an area that could grow, uh, kind of thing. And where do you see UC going in the future, and what do you hope for the school? 
So I'm, you know, I'm pleased we have new leadership um, with Neville Pinto, and uh, um, we have this 1819 uh, 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 innovation center, if you will, over uh, over on Reading Road, kind of thing. So there's an opportunity then um, for people that have an entrepreneurial bend to do things that maybe wasn't available uh, as easily, if you, uh, if I can put it that way, uh, as before. And uh, so I think that's a, uh, uh, a really positive uh, sort of thing. And that space then also allows, if allows for certain kind of interdisciplinary studies that um, need to be co-located. They, they mean need to be get it together in order to be successful. So I think that's a very, uh, uh, very positive uh, sort of thing. Um, the um, the VP for research has um, and and uh, and uh, the president and provost have launched a, um, a a digital digital initiative um, or digital futures initiative. And I think that has, uh, I have had some modest involvement in that, and uh, I think that has lots of possibilities. So, um, lots of possibilities in the research end of things where you use machine learning and artificial intelligence to advance a field. Um, but even for teaching, so that um, in principle you could have uh, uh, natural language recognized by from a computer program that could respond to your natural language question uh, kind of thing. And uh, that's a place where I think um, um, there could be large advances, so both in the research area and in the teaching area. So I think that's a, uh, and, and across disciplines too, not, I mean, we're talking about physics perhaps here, but uh, this would be across uh, the disciplines. So I think there are, uh, you know, if we were having this conversation, uh, uh, you know, even five years from now, then I think there'd be lots of advances in that area, kind of thing. Um, so, uh, so don't ignore artificial intelligence or machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some of your um, achievements in the in the university, like. As vice president, I see here it says vice president of research and university dean of advanced studies from 1999 to 2004. Do you want to explain? Do you want to like talk to us about like those? Stuff? Well, so yeah, the like, so the what were the responsibilities there? Well, to yeah. advance the research mus uh, mission of the university and to uh, um, advance the the graduate students and. Uh, so there are lots of possibilities there uh, I could talk about, but uh, um, so um, so I'll mention maybe a couple. Yeah. Uh, okay. And that's it. <laughs> the so one thing is that again resources matter, right? Okay. Great. So uh, so when I came into the office, I looked at whether there were endowments. So endowments give you uh, money every year that you could use for certain things. But they often have, almost always have, restrictions. They can be used for certain things. So I came across an endowment that said, this is for faculty members who haven't yet gotten their PhD to get their PhD, you know, to support them. Yeah. But we essentially don't have any such people. I mean... Uh, you know, everybody does have their PhD. PhD. Yeah. So it was actually, um, I don't know what you call it, idle. It was just sitting there and it was accumulating money and not being used. And the initial donor actually had died, and uh, the, but he had uh, um, some uh, uh, others that are associated with him, some offspring, so to speak. And uh, so I contacted them and said, can we... Uh, make this for faculty use, but not for this specific, you know, to get your PhD. And after some go-arounds, then this was, this was approved. So I used the money to, uh, to initiate a, a grant proposal writing um, seminar. And uh, so the idea is, 
uh, if you're new to writing grants, then there's lots to learn. And, uh, and you have to be nationally competitive. You can't just do, ah, I did a pretty good job, they should give me uh, some funding here. And, uh, and so uh, this was actually um, initiated and actually it's been continued in certain kinds of ways. And so that, what that does is it prepares you as a new faculty member to be successful in writing proposals. Now you have to have the idea, of course, but then there's more to writing the proposal than just having an, uh, an idea that's actually a pretty good idea. So I, I would say that was a, uh, you know, if you will, slightly unusual circumstance <laughs> kind of thing to, to, to discover an endowment, an endowment that wasn't being used and figuring out a way to yeah. uh, sort of use it. Um, so I was also successful in uh, getting at the university level a, um, a large influx of uh, funding to raise graduate stipends. And, uh, and again, you make the argument. So I got lots of data from lots of different places and showed that we were behind and uh, we needed to step up and, uh, um, and then that was supported at the, at the cabinet uh, level. So uh, um, I was happy to be able to, uh, uh, to actually, uh, actually do that. Um, I also initiated some some incentive programs. In other words, if you do this, if some department does, uh, you know, attracts some students that are uh, self-paying. So some students from um, from other countries um, come with government support, and uh, but this was not not all that common and not being paid attention to. And even some students within the U.S. Uh, are willing to pay, and uh, so I suggested that if you're able to do this, then we'll give you back a certain percentage of what uh, what comes in, and uh, this provided a, a stream of income that wasn't uh, wasn't present um, previously, um, and uh, so incentive programs work. And maybe as a as a last example, um, I also uh, used uh, what are called research challenge funds to um, to incentivize people to get together interdisciplinary uh, again and to uh, carry out research that'll lead to a proposal being submitted, kind of thing, and made that a comp a, comp a local competition. Mm -hmm. And actually, a couple of those have uh, um, certain a number of those were actually quite successful type of thing. So the increase in external funding was, uh, I mean, nearly a factor yeah. of two during that time. So that was, uh, uh, that was good. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. So, can you um, talk to us a little bit about some of your colleagues you find like like you also find your work deep down in the past and still doing or or maybe like have like retired or something like any of them you find like any of them's work you find like commendable is there anyone you want to talk about like that or like in, with like in the in the physics you know second sphere yeah not quite sure I'm getting the question. Yeah, okay. Uh, kind of I was trying to. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, people like you, you want to talk about. You know, people like maybe. So I, so I have a network of people that I talk to, right? Yeah. And, uh, and you have networks too. So everybody has <laughs> networks. And you may not call it a network, but, you know, a collection of your friends that you complain about or, uh, <laughs> or complain to, maybe. Um, and uh, so that's true also. Uh, I mean, this is true, I think, of every academic. There's a collection of people, and not just in the within the department, that uh, you have a relationship to who are, um, who will be honest with you, uh, honest in the, in the sense of evaluating an idea, for instance. So, um, you, if you're talking to these individuals, you can present an idea that's half-baked. And instead of saying, oh, here are the six reasons that'll never work, uh, or won't get you where you want to go, to go um, they're willing to keep the balls in the air and say, okay, yeah, right, that would give you this possibility. Well, what if you did this other sort of thing? And I think that's actually, uh, this network piece is, um, 
is really important. And I'm going to actually change the subject a little bit, okay. but it has to do with networks. Okay. Uh, when a new faculty member comes in, then um, I think there needs, and we do this in physics, there needs to be active mentoring. And that mentoring isn't just that, uh, okay, so if you're my mentor, you tell me everything I should be doing or whatever. Um, it means that when I have a question about something that maybe you're not an expert on, you know somebody who is an expert on or is more knowledgeable than you, and you introduce me to that. Okay. And so now I'm beginning to build my own network. Uh, own network. And that's, uh, I think, a way to get to uh, really effective mentoring. It's not just to one-on-one. -on -one. It's, uh, you know, it's the individual new faculty member uh, connected to a collection of people that becomes a, a network. So that's local, if you will, but that same idea applies in the uh, professional uh, uh, research sense, where um, you're at a meeting, for instance, it's, let's say you're a new faculty member, and uh, so if, uh, if I'm, uh, I'm the more senior member, I might introduce you to a couple of people that you should know because of their expertise, which maybe complements you, your own kind of thing. And uh, so facilitating that actually is a a key part to uh, making you a more effective researcher, I think, a more effective teacher for that matter, and uh, and more effective in the service sense, in the sense that you're connected maybe to people not just in physics, but maybe in engineering or maybe in history and, <laughs> and, uh, and beyond kind of thing. Okay, so... Um, this is we almost at the end, but like um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was looking at um, res research things like the school has done. Um, I saw something about using a laser to, so I think, help solve cancer or something like that. A YAG la laser or something. I think something like that. Is there any th like um, research that the physics department has done that is out there that is like maybe the first, the first to do? that or something. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, um, so some of the uh, previous efforts, um, okay, so how, how do I want to do this? So the idea that people are research active and externally funded is a validation of they're doing things that are new and um, uh, haven't been done before, before. because uh, you, that's the only way you actually get funded. Um, that's recognized, not only with that, but sometimes is also, pardon me, recognized in terms of um, uh, professional uh, recognition at the American Physical Society level. So there's something called, um, uh, you, you can become a fellow of the American Physical Society, and that recognizes some unique contribution. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of those in the department, of which I'm one kind of thing. So we did some work in what's called near-field optics that was um, was new and uh, um, and has uh, has developed into a whole field, actually, uh, kind of thing. And the same is true of the other um, individuals who are um, APS uh, fellows, uh, kind of thing. And so um, uh, the answer is yes. Lots yes, of uh, lots of innovative uh, research, and uh, um, and that's of course uh, very exciting. Now I actually I actually have a few patents as well, but I'm sorry to tell you that they're uh, they're not bringing in tons of money. So uh, <laughs> there are possibilities, but uh, they didn't uh, develop into anything that was. Uh, Truly useful, I guess, uh, kind of thing. All right, thank you. And um, lastly, is there a, is there anyone you would recommend for like an interview and why? Oh, you mean yeah, in terms like of yeah, the history in terms yeah. of like the knowledge with history. Right, right. Well, I'll have to give that some uh, <laughs> thank uh, you. some some thought. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the pieces is that. Um, you have an individual faculty member has choices of uh, what sort of balance between uh, the areas of research, teaching, and service uh, actually are. And uh, so if you're asking about um, people that have maybe a broader view of what's going on, you need people that have been intensively involved in service uh, kind of thing. 
and uh, and so if you look at actually some of the emeriti that were listed on the on the email that you you sent, then uh, a number of them are um, have useful would have useful things to say. One that person that comes to mind in chemistry is uh, Bruce Alt, A-U-L-T, um, but he's on the list and I don't know, I guess there are a number of interviewers oh, yeah. um, kind of thing, so you should last him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you so much. Oh, that was, that was <laughs> a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so I'm much. not sure whether you learned anything. But we did, we did, we did. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to even write a research about what you've talked to me about. I'm going to like find one thing that resonates with me. So I would write like a five-page research paper on that. Wow. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Right. And also, um, yeah, thank you. And also, 